Hi, welcome to this presentation on how an acetylcholine excess might be linked to depression. If indeed an acetylcholine excess is causing depression in many cases, that is a connection that suggests a couple of safely testable hypotheses for how one might lessen depression. Why do I care about depression? I live at a higher elevation, which appears to be linked to depression. I've seen people who are depressed and are on trying different medications, some of which don't seem to work much for them at all. I would like to see an end to the mystery of depression and ab ability for us to cure it. I started looking deeply into depression and what might be causing it when I read a short online article saying that within a few weeks of receiving Botox treatment for wrinkles, around half of patients were finding relief from depression. My initial suspicion was, oh, they're just happier with how they look now. But that does not appear to be the explanation. Even people who aren't necessarily happier with how they look after Botox often find that they get some relief from their depression, which raises a big question. Why does putting a poisonous toxin into the face muscles help relieve depression? Because Botox is poisonous. It works by suppressing the release of acetylcholine. And high levels of acetylcholine are now being looked at as a potential root cause of depression. Acetylcholine is something that our body synthesizes from choline, which is high in animal products, wheat germ, peanuts, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and other foods, but predominantly in wheat germ and animal products. Acetylcholine works on two different items the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, so named because they respond to nicotine, and the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, so named because they respond to a certain type of mushroom substance. But both of these respond to acetylcholine. I'm going to focus on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. It has been observed that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the brain can become desensitized after they are repeatedly exposed to stimulants. Such stimulants include nicotine and acetylcholine. In fact, some recent drug research on new antidepressants has specifically been looking at the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So here's my basic theory about acetylcholine and how it could be causing depression. We in the West eat a large amount of choline-rich food, so we can easily synthesize lots of acetylcholine. The constant exposure to plentiful acetylcholine in conjunction with other internal and external stimulators of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors can result in desensitization of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in our brains, dysfunction of which receptors is associated with depression. But when someone gets Botox inserted under the skin in their head, I think some of that makes it to the brain where it cuts the acetylcholine supply for a while allowing a reboot of the desensitized nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And then they can become more sensitive again because they haven't had to deal with the acetylcholine stimulation for a while. So if this hypothesis has merit, there are two easy ways to test it besides going out and getting Botox treatment. First, go on a low choline diet, unless you otherwise have a need for choline because of pregnancy or something else, for just a few days during which you should also avoid anything that would mess with your nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, especially nicotine, alcohol, recreational drugs, unnecessary stress, and then see if you feel different a couple weeks later. Don't do the low choline diet for an extended period of time, just for a few days. We need choline, just maybe not quite as constantly as we get it. Second, try gardening. Soil often contains Botox in very small amounts and therapeutic horticulture has been repeatedly observed to help lessen clinical depression. While I was looking into the question of how excess acetylcholine might be related to depression, I started wondering, well, what causes acetylcholine to be broken down in the body? The main enzyme that does that job is acetylcholinesterase. And it turns out that acetylcholinesterase doesn't like to be in an acidic environment. Seven is the middle is neutral for pH. And six, which isn't a lot lower, is kind of the lower point at which acetylcholinesterase is active. 
So if we have a highly acidic environment, acetylcholine is not going to be broken down. Why does the pH environment needed for acetylcholinesterase matter? After all, our brain usually is protected by a blood-brain barrier. Well, the brain is right next to the oral nasal cavities in our head. If you look at that picture there, and say you're in the habit of drinking, say, Diet Coke all the time. The pH of Diet Coke is around 2.5. It's very acidic. And imagine that having a little bit of an effect on the neighboring cells and that having an effect on the neighboring cells next to that. And eventually, you could be affecting your brain and bringing that pH down just enough to keep the acetylcholinesterases from breaking down acetylcholine like they need to. Let's look at what substances we put in our mouths that have a pH below 6. Let's see, soda pop. The highest pH soda pop listed on the website I give you in this PowerPoint is A&W root beer. It's at 4.75, well below 6. And as we go down the list, we get to Sprite, 3.29. Diet Coke, 3.28. Diet Coke with lime, 3.21. Diet Pepsi, 3.03. Coca-Cola, 2.52. Coca-Cola Classic, 2.5. I made a mistake, I guess, earlier when I said Diet Coke was uh, super acidic. It is acidic, but not quite as bad as regular Coca-Cola. Uh, juices and milk. Well, if you're drinking milk, hooray! Milk is actually close to a pH of 7. But nearly every other vegetable or fruit juice you could think of is going to be acidic. And if you're talking citrus juices, they're almost all below a pH of 4. Remember, we don't want a pH of below 6 if we want our acetylcholinesterase enzymes to be able to break down acetylcholine. What about coffee? Well, if we put milk in our coffee, then we can keep it above a 6 for pH. But once you've got black coffee, you're down below 6. What about tea? Well, if you put sugar in there, and especially if you put lemon or lemon juice or citric acid in there, you can bring down the pH quite a bit. Lemon nest tea apparently has a pH that's only around 2.9. Uh, what about energy drinks? Stay away from all of them. They pretty much all have a pH below 4. Bottled water. Some of them are actually alkaline. That means slightly higher than 7. Some of them are pretty low. If you're going for one with lemon or citric acid added to it for taste, then you've just dropped the pH to probably below 4. Um, and how about alcoholic beverages? Oh, they're pretty much all very acidic, 4.4 or below, according to what I'm looking at here. What can you do to help your mouth not be too acidic an environment? You can drink slightly alkaline water between meals, especially if you know your mouth environment is unusually acidic. I have a friend whose teenage daughter has been dealing with severe depression and anxiety issues, and they date back to when she went to live with her grandmother, who is obsessed with lemon juice, which is super, super acidic. And recently at the dentist, she had her mouth tested with a pH strip, and the dental tech said, oh, you have very, very acidic mouth. So um, she is now drinking alkaline water from an alkalinizing pitcher in, that sits in her refrigerator between her meals. And she likes the taste, and hopefully it's good for her teeth, and maybe it'll help her with her depression and anxiety issues. Another thing you can do if you just cannot give up your soda pop or other acidic drinks is rinse out your mouth afterward with a mixture of water and a little baking soda. Because baking soda dissolved into water is a slightly alkaline beverage that will help neutralize the acidic environment of your mouth afterward. Another thing you can do is just in general watch your use of fresh lemon juice and vinegar, both of which are highly acidic. Some websites claim that they will eventually turn into some sort of alkaline ash or alkalize the body, but that doesn't help your mouth in the short run, which is what I'm looking at. To conclude, if an excess of acetylcholine in the brain is indeed linked to depression or, you know, causing depression, there are three easy things you can do to try to prevent depression then. The first would be don't let your mouth remain acidic for long. Even if this doesn't help with depression, your teeth will thank you. Having a lot of acid in your mouth is really bad for your teeth. It dissolves the enamel. An interesting thing about dental hygiene is the more cavities a person has, the more likely they are to have depression. So you've got two great reasons to keep your mouth from being too acidic. 
And the easiest way to take care of that is swish with a little bit of baking soda in water once in a while and then spit it out. I'm not a big fan of swallowing baking soda all the time because you don't want to neutralize your stomach acids generally. Number two, there is lots of Botox in soil. So if you garden sometimes, you'll inhale just a little bit, not enough to hurt you, but maybe enough to kind of cut the supply of acetylcholine, a bit like getting Botox put into your wrinkles would do. Number three, try eating a diet with a low amount of choline for just a few days to see if that kind of helps reboot your nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and helps you feel better afterward. So as you see, these are all super safe, nothing too weird. You should be taking care of your teeth anyway and you know, acid on them is just a bad idea. And varying your diet is also a good thing to do. And gardening, who doesn't love to be out in the dirt sometimes, smelling that fresh smell. I hope this presentation has given you some good ideas on how to help uh, keep the acetylcholine levels in your head at the appropriate level and also how to take care of your teeth. I want to thank my daughter who found and put the clip art in the presentation that you see. Without it, it would have just been boring text because I'm not an artist. So I wish you well. Bye-bye.